No, I can't lock this. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to CDC. <clears throat> I, I, was, I was waiting to see uh, who we were waiting for, and then I realized it was me. Uh, I was supposed to start this, so uh, I wanted to welcome everyone here. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, and we're really pleased to host the ceremony for this week's Freeze Prize for Improving Health. I want to thank everyone who made this event possible with a warm welcome to Jim Fries and his wife, Sarah, who established this award, to his brother, Ken Fries, a former USAID chief counsel, and his wife, Janet, to members of the Fries Foundation board and prize jury, to Walt Dowdle, uh, who is a former uh, Fries Prize winner and formerly of CDC. Of course, we don't say formerly of CDC. You won CDC, always CDC. Um, and uh, I want to mostly welcome and congratulate today's honoree, Maturum or Matu uh, Santoshum. So welcome and thank you so much. Uh, we're honored and proud that CDC and the CDC Foundation have a partnership with the Fries Family Foundation. The, the Fries Prize is prestigious. It's presented annually to the person who's deemed to have done the greatest good for the greatest number of people. That's a pretty simple concept. Uh, and I think that's really the concept by which most of us evaluate our work. How can we do the most good for the most number? Pretty straightforward. Uh, it recognizes people who've made vital contributions to improving the public's health. Dr. Santosham has made big contributions in oral rehydration, childhood vaccination. He discovered, researched, promoted, and advocated for Hib vaccination, which is credited with saving the lives of 370,000 children per year. That's more than 1,000 kids a day. And I have to say that when I was in medical school, Hib was common. And I took care of many kids uh, with very severe infections with Hib and many seniors with very severe infections with Hib. And I remember one kid in particular who had what's called the steeple sign, which means he had epiglottitis, and his airway was closing. And you have two choices in that situation. You can either um, preventively do a tracheotomy, uh, but they'll then be on, uh, have a tracheotomy, they'll have a scar, it's, you know, they can get an infection, or you can stay up all night with them and make sure that they can continue to breathe. And if they have any problems, then you can do a controlled but urgent or emergent tracheotomy. So I stayed up all night with this kid. Uh, and this was not unusual. This is what we did because there was lots of Hib. It was a frequent cause of pneumonia, epiglottitis, a uh, variety of ear infections, other infections. For seniors who smoked and who had COPD, it was a common cause of pneumonia and bronchitis. And then, the Hib vaccine came out, and it began getting implemented. And I don't know, Dr. Shook is going to correct me if I say this, because I don't know if it's correct or Dr. Santoshim. But um, my impression was that the herd immunity from Hib was remarkably strong. Once you got to even 30, 40 percent vaccination rates, rates plummeted way beyond that 30 or 40 percent protective efficacy. So it really was an example of the change. And nowadays. Uh, you know, doctors getting trained have never seen a case. It's that rare. That kind of change for the world is what each of us, I think, should aspire to for our career. And we're delighted to be able to salute Dr. Santosham's career, and you'll hear more about it. Um, uh, we know that Jim and Sarah didn't start this because um, uh, they started this for one reason, and that's that they wanted to recognize uh, public health heroes. They recognized that public health is often 
uh, most successful when nobody notices. Uh, those kids who today's interns and medical students are not staying up all night with because they're not sick with HIV. Um, we also want to increase the awareness of what's being done and then the success stories of public health and improving lives here and around the world, and that's what we do at CDC. We work 24-7 to protect Americans, and never is it clearer than today that our health is intricately and intimately bound up with the health of people all over the world, that an outbreak anywhere is a threat everywhere. Um, before the next speaker comes up, I also want to thank uh, Gary Cohen. And at this event, uh, we'll be honoring Gary for his board service to the CDC Foundation uh, with the presentation of a U.S. flag flown over the Capitol. And on everyone's behalf at CDC, Gary, thank you so much for your ser service. We really appreciate it. And now I'll ask Dr. Ann Shuket to come up and give some reflections in this area. This is just such a special occasion. It's, it's um, personally so special for me to get to be here and participate in this wonderful event. Um, you're going to hear formally about Dr. Man, uh, Matu Santosham from Dr. Freeze in a moment, but I just want to share a few words um, from my personal associations with um, Matu. I've known uh, Matu for more than 15 years, but of course I knew of him before I got to meet him myself. And as you'll hear, his contributions are really just extraordinary um, in terms of the impact and prospects for the 130 million babies born every year that are really touched by the influence that he's had. He's made particularly important contributions to the world of the disease caused by Hib, the Haemophilus influenza B bacteria, as well as through the oral rehydration solution. Um, but more than that, he's worked on behalf of children living in some of the world's most impoverished and difficult environments. Um, beyond the vast public health experience and accomplishments that this gentleman hero has, I think the distinguishing feature of his work is the deeply held respect he conveys to the people he serves, whether in American Indian communities in Arizona or in Africa or in India. Uh, many years ago, Matu visited the CDC to meet with some of our staff about a possible collaboration with us on a project in the American Indian population um, with his uh, research program there. Um, the technical expertise of our proposed collaborator collaborators was really not his focus or his concern. He was probing to see if our team had the personal characteristics to interact with the community respectfully and up to the standards that he held and thank goodness our team passed the test. Um, and we started a, a really long and wonderful collaboration there and, and around the, around the world. Um, Matu has been committed to training, mentoring, capacity building, um, all of which could not be more critical today when we look around the world at the challenges, particularly with the Ebola um, challenges in Africa. Um, there are countless students, health workers, faculty, and leaders who've been mentored by Matu. Uh, Matu, the work that you do saves lives and inspires so many of us um, to take up the cause of improving the public's health. Um, congratulations on this tremendously well-deserved recognition. Um, now I'm going to turn things over to Charlie Stokes, the head of the CDC Foundation, who's going to um, introduce the freezes. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Well, again, I'm Charlie Stokes, president and, CD, uh, president and CEO of the CDC Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the board of directors and staff of the CDC Foundation. We were created uh, more than 20 years ago now to help CDC by bringing private sector philanthropists and organizations into partnership with CDC to extend their capacity to do the job that they're so passionate about doing. And in that regard, earlier this year, we announced that Jim and Sarah Freeze, with the Freeze Foundation, were going to be making a gift and endowing the CDC Foundation to enable us uh, to carry on uh, their legacy uh, in the awarding annually of two prizes 
First is the Freeze Foundation, or the Freeze Prize, which is going to be awarded today. And the other one is the Elizabeth Freeze Health Education Award that's given annually in the spring. And at this time, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jim and Sarah, who have become, over many years, great friends of ours. Sarah is a nationally and internationally known health educator. She served as president of an organization uh, she and Jim created called Health Track for more than 15 years. And this was an esteemed and much recognized tailored population health improvement company. Together, she and Jim created the Freeze Foundation in 1991. So Sarah, thank you for being here. We're proud to have you in our midst. Jim recently retired from Stanford University where he served as a medical professor for more than 40 years. He's a world-renowned physician and researcher in the advancement of healthy aging. In addition to his groundbreaking medical work, Jim, along with Sarah, has con contributed considerable personal gifts toward improving human health. Jim came up with the idea for the Freeze Prize in a 1987 ascent of one of the tallest peaks in the world. He got caught in a snowstorm there, and uh, in the midst of that storm, he said, you know, if I make it back to the ground, I'm gonna create a prize uh, to award the person who does the most to improve the health for the most people. Um, and that award is gonna be a $60,000 award. Uh, and uh, so uh, Jim and Sarah, uh, luckily his failure to um, reach that peak was the world's uh, uh, good news because since then Jim uh, came back, he and Sarah have created uh, this prize uh, which is becoming better and better known every year. And uh, so it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome Jim and Sarah to the CDC this afternoon. And I wanna introduce Jim now. Please help uh, give a warm uh, round of applause for Jim. Thank you, Charlie, uh, very, very much. Uh, the, uh, I, I'm not gonna say a lot of words about Matthew because you're gonna hear them from him in a little while. I wanna say a few about the foundation. You've heard some of them from Charlie here. This is the prize itself, which is sitting here to the left and it's cast every year uh, with the lost wax method and given uh, to the recipient this year. This is the 23rd occasion of this award and the previous recipients have exemplified the kinds of goals that we had hoped there were enough people alive who merited at that particular point. The mission, as you've heard, is to identify and honor individuals whose achievements have, been, have made the greatest contribution to the health of the public. When we want to do a little personal conceit, we say this is the noblest prize of them all. Prizes for major accomplishments in health improvement, unrestricted as to field of endeavor. And that's important because improvements in health which are major and earth-shaking and affect a lot of people can come from a lot of different fields. Uh, people from entirely different lines of, they're not the places you would think that, oh, it's the medical scientists made by the NIH. It's not, not very often. It's other kinds of people doing other kinds of things for the, for the public health, uh, uh, through the media, being advocates, a whole variety of activities which improve the, the health. So very major decision very early on was to say the criteria was the greatest good for the greatest number, but the field of endeavor was not, uh, was not important. This was not a, a regional type of, it was an all, all over that tended for that individual, not a group or a committee who's done the most as judged by a prestigious prize jury. Now, this is the prize jury and I won't go through people in detail, but you'll recognize probably a number of, uh, of, of names, uh, uh, largely academic, some from government, Institute of Medicine, uh, Charlie Stokes from the CDC uh, 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 Foundation, uh, a variety of, of different backgrounds, all of them very smart people and all of them commonly in, in common involved in the task 
which is to identify people often unidentified generally if you were to ask the public about them, but the people who had actually made the contributions from which we have all benefited. Uh, this is a selected list of the, of the 23 recipients before. I've kind of bolded a few of the, of the people. Bill Fagey, who's a longtime uh, uh, hero of the CDC for the eradication of smallpox, uh, was the first recipient in 1992. Uh, it's Bill up at the top in a younger pose. Uh, in the middle is uh, uh, C. Everett Koop, who is Surgeon General and took uh, activism at the level of being a Surgeon General to a level that had never been encountered before. And it made a lot of, of differences in uh, tobacco, AIDS, diseases of children. Uh, William Cannell, was, uh, uh, who's in the bottom, was Framingham. Uh, Framingham was the first longitudinal study that actually looked at health outcomes and it established much of what we know now about cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular outcomes and everything, like Charlie Hennikins, who won the award last year, was doing it for aspirin, which was a therapy which could be predicted from the results of the Framingham study. So you can kind of see the way in which these large achievements are intertwined uh, uh, with each other. Uh, Bill Sargent for polio in the Americans. Uh, Don Hopkins seen at the top here for guinea worm disease. Very fascinating uh, uh, approach. Uh, uh, Al Summer for vitamin A death in, uh, in children. Uh, Walter Dowdle, who's pictured uh, there and is with us uh, uh, today. Richard Cash uh, for oral rehydration therapy in cholera, an area in which Dr. Satisham was also, also has been involved. Uh, Charles Hennigan, as I mentioned, for low dose. Uh, aspirin. So you can see the different kinds of contributions and you'll recognize the importance of each of these achievements. They're, these are big things. In general, when we started using the terminology some people were using, like how many lives saved or how many disabilities and so forth prevented, these are millions. They're all in the millions. Now the problem that we're gonna discuss the solution of today is hip meningitis, and I was in medical school too uh, when uh, we we treated uh, this condition, and it was uh, it, it had a, a huge mortality rate, and there were a lot of deaths, and there were a lot of sleepless nights, and things like uh, like that that were part of the caring for people with a major major disease. Uh, Twenty to fifty percent mortality, thirty percent long term neurological sequelae because it was a meningitis. And so it had permanent things that were short of death, which it also did. Uh, Eight million cases annually worldwide, uh, 700,000 lives currently estimated to have been saved over the 20, 2000 to 2011 time with a WHO estimate and a prediction of seven million lives expected to be saved by 2020, uh, which is uh, uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and, uh, uh, and, and Immunizations, Gavi, uh, has made that estimate, and I think no one would say these are very far uh, from the mark. It's, a, it's been a huge problem, and it's largely a problem which has been reduced. Uh, Maturam Santosham is with us today. He was nominated by Professor Richard Moxon from Oxford, and he is widely recognized for bringing one of the most lethal diseases of childhood, uh, hip meningitis, to near elimination in many countries. His uh, career developed in many ways as a long-term siege battle against uh, uh, Hib and related diseases. He uh, began uh, in 1977 on uh, chasing uh, this and related infections. Detecting bacteremia in childhood in 1977 when that was a new concept. Uh, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine on Hib bacterial immune globulin and its effectiveness uh, in, in treating Hib uh, uh, meningitis. Uh, 1991, a taking of this into the field, and this is one of the things that we've admired most in his work. Uh, he's taken it to the American Indians in the field. He's taken it to the Indian Indians in the field. He's taken it in the areas where the disease was thriving and resistant to attack because the organizational structures uh, were not in place uh, to enable that to, uh, uh, to happen. We've uh, uh, characterized this as uh, bringing the treatment to the 
vulnerable. Actually, I should mention his chair, chairing in 2004 of the uh, conference in Scottsdale in which global reduction of, of HIB was discussed by all of the involved parties and a plan of action was undertaken and he chaired and, and uh, backed that, uh, uh, that th those decisions. Uh, this bringing the treatment to the vulnerable uh, and the upscaling of an advance into changing the course of health has been characteristic of a number of people who have won the Freeze Prize. And I, I think it's one of the proudest things that we are, is that you find, the, you find the accomplishment to be not rooted in just the discovery of something or the identification or the naming of something, but actually carrying your activities wherever they lead you into defeating that particular disease. And that means, uh, uh, partnerships with Gavi or WHO or any of the involved people who are naturally interested in these same kinds of things. And if you can give a means and a strategy and a public forum, uh, then you can actually get the, the last stage of fighting these kinds of illnesses, which is the upscaling. It's the, it's the from a few to many. Uh, and he exemplifies that uh, attribute uh, extremely well. Uh, and uh, Shukat uh, uh, was one of his nominators, who you've just heard from, uh, with a, a tribute to his uh, accomplishments. Uh, his uh, sponsor, Richard Moxon from Oxford, uh, a beacon for countless scientists of the future, uh, Robert Black at, at Hopkins. There's no more humble, talented, focused scientist who has made major contributions to so many domains, including uh, HIV, meningitis, diarrhea, pneumococcal, and neonatal death. So the award for 2014, the Freeze Prize for Improving Health, goes to Maturum Santosham, MD, MPH, for his exemplary research, vaccine development, policy, and advocacy toward the global prevention of hemophilus influenza type B meningitis in children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have my slides, please? Am I supposed to do something? <laughs> Here it goes. Wait, wait, let's see. Try one more. Oh. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for those gracious remarks. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes some of my, uh, mostly my failures in life. Uh, many people talk about their successes. I think if there's anyone who's been a champion of failures is probably me. I've probably fallen more times than anyone else. And I want to take you through this journey that started very long time ago. But I want to start out with some acknowledgments. First of all, Dr. Friedman, since you may have to leave, let me say that in 1975, I applied to be an EIS officer, <laughs> and I did not get in. <laughs> 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 So to be introduced and to be welcomed by the director of CDC is a uh, unthinkable honor for me. Thank you so much for making time. I want to thank you for what you've done for the world with the Ebola uh, epidemic and what the CDC has done. My hat's off to this, this great organization. Uh, I do regret that you didn't take me in in 1975. <laughs> but, First of all, I want to thank my family, my dear wife, who's here, Pat, Pat Santosham, and my two children, Vasant and Shireen. And without their unwavering support, I could never have done what I've done, especially my wife. When we went out to the reservation, within, within a week, Shireen had pneumonia. And, and of course, all of you know who travel, whenever you're out of town, the child gets sick. I think everyone in the audience can relate to that. The other uh, people, the other couple that I would like to recognize are my parents. John 
S.J. Wilfred and Flora Wilfred. Now, you may all wonder why my dad's name is Wilfred. <laughs> well, when my father in the 1930s went to college, this was under the British rule. The principal was a British man. He said, what is your name? And we were Christians. So he said, J John Santoshim, sir. Nobody can pronounce Santoshim. We'll just call you Wilfred. So for the rest of his career, he was known as S.J. Wilfred. In fact, he's the uh, ambassador in Zambia several years ago. Everyone said, Ambassador Wilfred is congratulating. It was all over the newspapers. But, I, but my father insisted that our, my, myself and my brother Tom, who's here, should be called Santoshim. But I am related to S.J. Wilfred. <laughs> so, <laughs> my journey in many ways, my career began when I was very young. When I was five years old, my father was posted to Nepal. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Nepal. It's quite a challenge getting there even today. But those days, from Delhi to Calcutta, you took two nights by train. And they went by an overnight bus to, Kathmand, uh, to the border of uh, Nepal. And then you were carried in a thing called a dandy. And this is a dandy. And this is what myself, my sister, Shanti, who's not here, and my brother were carried in for one week. You sat in this thing. And a guy in front, a guy in the back, jogs along. And we finally get to Nepal after seven days. And there are no schools in Nepal. So they send my brother and sister back on the dandy back to India. And then they tried to do that to me. That my mother tried that three times. They tried to send me back. Every time I'd cry and come back again, because I didn't want to be in that dandy for another seven days. So, <laughs> so, so ultimately, I got, uh, you know, I, when I was five years old, and this had a profound impact on my career. When I was five years old, my mother took me to the, to the market. She saw all these kids with quash yorker, draining ears, impetigo. And my mother saying to me, one day you should become a doctor and help all of these children. Now the problem was, that's great to become a doctor, but I, there was no school. I wasn't going to school. And I did not go to school till I was eight years old. And finally, when I was eight years old, my dad said, I don't care how much he cries, he has to go to school. So, <laughs> so they took me to this little town in Madurai. You know, uh, there was one plane those days that belonged to the Indian ambassador that flew like once a week. And we had wait online, wait online. Uh, finally, we got to, uh, got to Madurai, where my grandmother was. And my uncle happened to be a lawyer. In those days, if you're a lawyer, you're a big shot, because there are no lawyers in India those days. So my uncle said, no worries. You know, we'll get him to school. So they went to this convent school run by the British. Uh, and the British uh, headmistress said, uh, you want your nephew admitted? He said, of course, no problem. But what has he studied? He said, he hasn't studied. So, so he said, which grade do you want to put him in? I said, well, just test him, see what he, what he knows. And they, she asked me all these questions. I couldn't answer any of them. And finally, she got so frustrated. said, can you please spell it for me? And I spelled it as E-T. <laughs> so, so anyway, I was quite proud of myself. I got 50% right. So, <laughs> so, so, so she said, well, uh, my uncle then said, what, uh, what grade do kids go when they're, when they're eight years old? Well, they go to fourth class. OK, put them in fourth class. So I was there and somehow struggled along. They gave me tuition. And then when I'm 12 years old, my dad gets posted to Bonn in Germany. Those days, it's quite a, quite a journey to get from Madurai to Madras, to now called Chennai, Chennai to Mumbai, and then two weeks in a, in a boat. Uh, this, this here is me, this is my brother, and this is my sister, Shanti. So we finally get, they send my brother and myself to a boarding school in Scotland. Scotland those days was a miserable place. <laughs> and a boarding school was the worst place you could ever be at. No running hot water, no central heating. And there was an exam at that time called the 11 plus exam. That determined whether you're gonna, going to finish high school and go on to college, or you go to vocational school. And the scoring system was S1 to S3. If you, you had to get an S in order to finish high school. Now, J1 was the bright end of the dumb kids, and J4 was the lowest, the dumbest of the dumb. And I, I wrote the exam, and I got a J3. And so the principal called me in, because they need to decide now which vocation you're going to. He said, no, Mataram, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a doctor. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> you could be an engineer, or you could be an automobile, uh, an automobile technician. In fact, my wife always says, you know, God's way of saving lives was to make sure you don't become an automobile technician. So, so, so you know, how, it's amazing how things turn out in life. 
I had a teacher, my primary school teacher, Miss Grant, she came in and said, go back to the class. She argued with the headmaster and said, I have, a, I have convinced the headmaster we're going to give you a second chance, but you have to come in early every morning, stay at lunchtime, stay after school, and I will coach you. And Miss Grant, I wish I had a picture of her, she made me believe in myself because I was so frustrated. Everybody seemed smarter than me. I couldn't get anything right. I was second to the bottom in the whole of Scotland. I think I got the worst, <laughs> worst grade. And so somehow, because of Miss Grant, I could go to high school and finish high school. Eventually ended in Jipmer, Pondicherry. I was delighted to know that Tom Frieden actually knows Jipmer. Tom spent uh, five years in, in uh, India. But Jipmer is important for many reasons, uh, not not least of which is where I found my wife, Pat. And in Jipmer, I found that there were so many cases of diarrhea. In my final year of medical school, every single day in a room about half this size, and a kid dying here and a kid dying here and a kid dying here, all in front of me, and all it, and I was the only house surgeon, they called them house surgeons. I had to put, a, I, between me and the nurse, we had to hydrate all these kids with IV. We had nothing else. So I kept thinking there must be something you can do about this. And eventually, I finished my, uh, finished my high school, um, I finished my medical school, and I tried to get into postgraduate programs in India. There were really no postgraduate programs. There were only two or three, and I couldn't get in. Applied to the US. And in those days, I, I don't know how many of you are, I know, uh, Jim, you know, there were shortage of doctors in the 70s, and they, they opened the floodgates to bring foreign graduates in. And there would be all these private hospitals They were trying to bring staff in to man the hospitals. Not, not to train them, but they would claim to be training programs. So there was this little hospital called Church Home and Hospital, which was really an old people's home. And they said they were affiliated with Hopkins. They were stones throw away from Hopkins, which was true. They were stones throw away, but it was not a training program. So I got very disappointed. I got there and I said, I would, I, and one of the private practitioners asked me, Matthew, what do you want to do? I said, I want to become a pediatrician. I thought I was coming to Hopkins. This is no Hopkins. He said, did you, did you apply? I said, yes, but they don't want to take me. He said, no, try again. And he sent me, and I did an interview. And one of the professors, who's uh, Dr. Leakman, uh, looked at me and said, you know what? You are wasting your time. We do not take foreign graduates. Why don't you be more realistic and apply to something else? And ultimately, I, was, uh, in, I, was, I ended up in a small hospital called Baltimore City Hospitals. And I always tell young people some of the worst adversities, some of the most disappointments always turn out to be the best thing in your life. I was crushed. Here I had come all the way to Baltimore to go to Hopkins. And this reminds me of, the, you know, this is this famous thing between William Osler said to William Welsh. He said, Welsh, it's lucky that we got in as professors. We'd never get in as, as uh, students, <laughs> which is exactly what happened to me. But the good thing was, it's, it turns out Dr. Harold Harrison here Dr. Harold Harrison in this corner was the world's expert in fluid and electrolyte balance. Bradley Sack was one of the original pioneers in diarrheal diseases, and some of you, I'm sure Jim knows Bradley Sack. And Richard Moxon happened to be working on, he was the infectious disease consultant for City Hospital. And I also had the good opportunity to, good luck to meet uh, Bob Black, who's in the audience, who many of you know is the architect of child survival in many ways. We became very good friends, he became my department chair. And all of these people have had a tremendous influence in my life. And Harold Harrison said, once uh, Harold Harrison said, why don't you do some studies on oral rehydration? I said, Dr. Harrison, I have no money. And he got very angry with me. He said, Matu, research doesn't come from money. It comes from good ideas. Money will follow. And he really inspired me to work on this. And, and I did a, and then I applied besides CDC. I did apply to other programs. I applied to infectious disease fellowships and nobody would take me. Again, I was crushed. And it then turned out, went to Richard Markson, who was at the ID consultant. He said, don't worry about ID programs. They just teach you to give antibiotics anyway. So we'll, we'll just, why don't you work with me? And he took me under his wings. He's the one who inspired me to work on Haemophilus influenza type V disease. And just when I had finished my training, uh, Bradley, Bradley Sachs said to me, you know, I have this program in Calcutta in India where he was working on cholera. I'm looking for somebody to run studies on diarrheal disease and treatment. I'm very excited. Pat and I were excited. We were ready to go. And of course, Indo-Pakistan war broke out. US supported Pakistan. So India got mad, said all US projects have to leave right away. Again, another big black, 
I was so disappointed again that saying, wow, well, this is what I wanted to do, it's not going to happen. So Brad said to me, he'd gotten another grant to work on the Apache Indian Reservation. He said, Matu, there's this population called the Apache Indian I'd never even heard of. You know, when I was growing up, it was cowboys and Indians, and in India, we called them Red Indians. And so, we, you know, that's all I knew about Indians. But he said, they are dying of diarrhea just like in Bangladesh and India. You can go there for a year and things will clear up and then you can go back. Well, that was 35 years ago. So anyway, we eventually uh, did go to White River in Arizona with my family. Children were very small. My wife was gracious enough to take. She was a very successful anesthesiologist in Baltimore, but she was willing to go with me. And this turned out to be one of our biggest, not only the biggest adventures, one of the most exciting things that happened to my family. You know, the Apache people and Navajo people have a great deal of tradition that goes along. The, uh, when I first arrived there, there was a great deal of suspicion for a very good reason. Here's a guy who's not white, he's not American Indian, calling himself Indian. And, <laughs> and, and, and when, the, when I presented this whole program, Dial Disease Program, the chairman of the tribe looked at me and said, now Doc, are you going to take advantage of us just like all these white guys? He said, Mr. Chairman, if, if Columbus had known his geography better, I would be living on a reservation, you'd be studying me. So, <laughs> so, so with that, he said, go ahead, do whatever you want. <laughs> but people often talk about why Indians are so difficult to work with. And I think you'll understand, I'll just try to give you a glimpse of what they've had to suffer. Columbus arrived, and this is a, uh, from the uh, journals of, of one of the Jesuit priests who accompanied him, said the admiral was so anxious to please the king that he committed irreparable crimes against the Indians. There are terrible things that happened. They cut off their arms, cut off their legs, because Columbus was not interested in their welfare. He wanted gold, because he wanted to please the king. And even centuries later, 300 years later, here's a note from a general to his subordinates. Says, you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets in which smallpox patients have slept, as well as by every other method that can serve to extirpate this execrable race. This is what the people were doing, and this, has, this continued all the way through to the 1800s. And then many of you might have heard of the Trail of Tears. Indians were moved all the way from Georgia, all the way to Oklahoma. That happened to many tribes. Nothing is more important to an American Indian than land. They call it Mother Earth, Father Sky. And this was it's a terrible trauma to their, uh, to their communities. And you can see how much land the Indians owned in 1850 and what happened by 1880. You may know, some of you may have heard of the code talkers, the Navajo to code talkers. Unfortunately, the last of the code talkers are now dead, but the, during the Japanese war, it's the code talkers who are credited with helping, helping the US to win the war. And I happen to know uh, Arthur Hubbard, his granddaughter, Olivia, actually was my student who then went on to graduate, and these men are very, very brave men were actually decorated by uh, President Clinton about uh, 10 years ago. And then there was this attempt at assimilation. Children would be sent off far away, away from their homes and made to wear local clothes. Not, they were not allowed to practice their own religion, not able to uh, practice their traditions. And this is Lena Whitehair, one of my uh, community health workers. She tells me about these stories at middle of the night they would try on their Navajo clothes because they would be beaten if they were seen with their Navajo clothes. They would be beaten if they spoke their language. They would be beaten if they conducted their ceremonies. This is the kind of trauma that the Indian communities have had to, had to endure for years and years. Anyway, when I got there, I was absolutely shocked. I saw cases of diarrhea just like, like I had seen back in Jipmer Pondicherry almost uh, 20 years before. Not 20 years, it was about 10 years before. And I think many of you remember some of the, uh, not, not many of you, most of you are too young to remember these diary awards around the world. And of course, being from CDC, you're always taught to isolation techniques, but they don't really work in this kind of situation. You just keep going back and forth. But you all can relate to the fact that diarrhea doesn't always come at the most convenient times, right? When you're traveling and aren't, every one of us have uh, suffered uh, traveler's diarrhea. The problem was, you know, like, uh, uh, Bradley Sack, Richard Cash, and others had shown that ORS works for cholera. But people in the US didn't believe it because there were problems with hypernatremia in the 50s because people didn't understand the concept of sodium and, and glucose coupling. They gave 
In the 50s, Dr. Harold Harrison, who's the pioneer of oral radiation therapy, developed ORS, and the commercial company decided to market it. And the way they marketed it was to sell it as a powder form, and the patients were asked to mix it with one liter of water. Now, if you tell a mother that a tablespoon of something is good for you, of course, two tablespoons better than one, and there were many cases of hypernatremia. So US pediatricians vehemently, the senior pediatricians who were teaching me and teaching us were telling us, ORS is not the right thing to do, it's dangerous. And, and we'd say, why is it dangerous? We'll say, because it causes hypernatremia. Now, this is the worst case of hypernatremia that's ever, ever been recorded in history. <laughs> Luckily, that didn't happen. But we were able to demonstrate by using ORS alone, we could, whether it was hypernatremia or hyponatremia, we could correct the electrolyte imbalance. The other big issue was Bob Black had shown by that time that an average child in Bangladesh has six to eight episodes of diarrhea. And we saw in the Apache and Navajo kids also had six to eight episodes. But the standard teaching was, I think Barbara will remember this as a pediatrician, when you have diarrhea, you rest the gut. That's what was taught for centuries. That's what mothers believe. This is the textbook of pediatrics which says usually diarrheal intake uh, dietary intake is achieved seven to eight days. You starve a kid for seven to eight days. That's what we were teaching. And I think about that, and now everybody takes it for granted, ORS can be used and training can be done. I often think when I walk around the wards with the, with the residents, say, how, how many things am I teaching right now where people will laugh at about 50 years from now? And you know, this New York Times quote says, half of what we teach you is wrong. Unfortunately, we don't know which half, <laughs> which, which is probably very true. But anyway, when, when I arrived there, the situation was really bad. The children, you know, the, in these populations, often they didn't have transportation. It's gotten a little better now, but it's still terrible. And many children arrive too late, and the only thing you can do in that situation is do a cut down. And, and eventually, we, did, we were able to introduce ORS and get rid of all the diarrheal deaths. We did, within two years, they didn't, didn't see any diarrheal deaths at all. But a few years, about in 2009, we had a 30th year reunion to just celebrate our work on the Apache Indian Reservation. And this is Reverend Gunther here. He was the minister who was born on the reservation. And he reminded me that in the two months before we had arrived, he had buried 30 babies from diarrhea and dehydration. That's how bad it was. So we then introduced ORS. And I think all of you know the ORS story. It saved millions of lives. Now there were about 5 million deaths in 1980. Now we're down to less than 600,000. And the Apache Navajos had so much to do with this, with this success. The fact that US pediatricians accepted it actually increased the uptake across the world because they said, why should we use second class medicine if US doesn't want to use ORS? While I was dealing with this issue, there was a big epidemic of uh, rotavirus, and I was dealing with that. Within a three month period, there were five cases of invasive homophilus influenza disease. And I remembered from my city hospital days, that seemed like extraordinarily high. I re because Richard Moxon and I had done a retrospective survey, and the attack rate in the normal general US population was about 50 per 100,000. And did the calculation, it was about between 500 to 1,000 per 100,000. And you know, I think you all know about Haemophilus influenzae. It's an amazing organism. It was thought to be the cause of influenza. And, and epidemics were thought to be an evil influence. That's how you can, the whole name came about, Haemophilus influenzae. And my very first experience with Haemophilus influenzae was when I was an intern at the Baltimore City Hospital. A nine-month-old baby came with bulging fontanelle irritability. I called the senior resident. He said, I'm too busy. Do a spinal tap. Call me back. I put the needle in, and the CSF hit my chest. It was turbid. And, that, and I looked. In those days, I think you all remember, we had to do our own, uh, our own gram stains. And this is what I, what I saw. And then I would see many, many more cases. And then. Uh, Tom Friedman talked about epiglottitis, and you know this is unfortunately one that we could not save. Child died in postmortem. Child with meningitis, empyema, orbital cellulitis was a major problem. And I looked at the attack rates. I brought a couple of medical students, did a retrospective chart review, and it indeed this was not an epidemic here. They indeed were having very very high rates of Haemophilus influenzae disease. Not only that. Unlike the general US population, where about 20% of cases were under six months of age, 40 to 50% were under six months of age. So not only did we have to come up with a vaccine that works in children under two, it had to be effective in children under six months of age. And I looked around for what was available. 
The only vaccine that was available was the pure polysaccharide vaccine called the PRP vaccine that was shown in Finland to be efficacious and safe in children about two years of age, but not under that age. But that, that was of totally no use to us because 95% of our cases were under two years of age. So I was looking around to see what else we can do. I also looked at the immune responses of, this, uh, of the PRP in, in the Caucasian population versus the Apache Indian, and there was a tenfold less immune response in the Apache Indian. So I realized this is not the answer. Fortunately for me, I called around the country and I came, I was introduced to George Sieber actually by Richard Moxon and Donna Ambrosino. They were working with immunocompromised individuals at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And they were giving this product called hyperimmune globulin or BPIG. And they were able, they had anecdotal experience to show by giving repeated injections of BPIG, you could actually, they thought, anecdotal, this was not a randomized trial, they felt that they could reduce the incidence of disease. So I called up George and said, George, I have this tremendous rates of disease. Can I get BPIG for my population? Because these kids are dying. He said, well, you have to call FDA. Called FDA, FDA said, well, you have to apply for IND. So we decided if we're going to apply for IND, we might as well do a proper study. We did a randomized control study. And indeed, we were able to demonstrate that BPIG was highly efficacious against hemophilus influenzae type disease, type B disease. The problem was the product was very expensive, $100 a dose which was unacceptable, and we had to give repeated injections every three months. But the even worse was we had to give very large volumes, so it was like for a three-month-old <laughs> three baby, we had to give five cc. so this was not acceptable. So fortunately for us, just about that time, several conjugate vaccines became available. The new conjugate technology became available, where one uses a protein carrier and links it to a PRP, and when you link PRP to a protein, you make it more immunogenic, and also repeated injections end up uh, inducing a booster response, unlike the pure PRP vaccine. So I looked at all of these vaccines. The only one that produced a good immune response after a single dose was this PRP OMP. And so remember in this population, a very high proportion of disease under six months of age so I decided to do a randomized control trial on the Navajo Reservation. Now the Navajo Reservation is about 27,000 square miles, and from one end to the other is 300 miles. And we had to maintain surveillance throughout this huge piece of land. There are two individuals that helped me with this, Janae Kroll and Ray Reed. Janae Kroll was a young lab technician, Ray Reed was a young Navajo physician. Between us, we had to hire 60, 60 new staff, train them, we had to do the SOPs, write the protocols, get the IRB clearance. We had to get over 40 different IRB clearance, and these were not just at Hopkins and, uh, and in Rockville and in Maryland. We had to go to the communities, and we had to get it from each little community. Now, when you go to these meetings, often they occur very late at night. They talk in their own language, and you don't know what's happening. But fortunately for us, eventually we were able to get those 40 clearances. And these people are very wise. They also have a tremendous sense of humor. And one of these guys drew a card and said, Dr. Santosh, I understand why you need a control group. But then my concern is the other group is going to be completely out of control here. So, <laughs> so, so. anyway, it is very rough terrain. I don't know how many of you have been to the Navajo Reservation. You, know, you go to a single home, there'll be no home. It's unlike some communities where they live in clusters. You may drive about 50 miles and not find that family at home. And also, the road conditions are very rough. These are things that happen to you on the... Larry Moulton is our statistician, came for a site visit, and he got stuck in the mud. So then he had to hike out on this. And he, the whole time he was talking about the statistical, statistical chances of this happening to him again. So, <laughs> and, the, and the sad part of this is even today, today, 40% of Navajo population don't have running water, running, running water in their homes. That's the sad situation here. So this is the situation we had to deal with. Anyway, we did conduct the trial. It was a tremendous success. There were, it was a double-blind, randomized control trial. We gave the vaccine at two months, four, and two months and four months of age to the intervention group and placebo to the other group. No cases in the vaccine group and 21 in the placebo group. And what was more, even more exciting was between the first dose and second dose, in that two-month period, there are eight cases in the placebo and none in the vaccine group. So this was uh, more than what we thought we would, uh, uh, more successful than what I thought we'd get. This was a historical picture now. Not a single child in the world had received this 
licensed vaccine. I was so excited, I ran up and down telling everybody, you know what, we now have a hip vaccine, called up people. Nobody seemed that excited. And I was wondering what was going on, which so happens that Saddam Hussein decided to invade Kuwait on the same day that we broke code. So nobody was interested in a hip vaccine. So anyway, for me, it was still exciting. We did, we did get it licensed very quickly. We introduced the vaccine and the disease plummeted in the, hip, in the, in the Apache Navajo population. And also, Anne Schuchert's very uh, aware of this. Dramatically, the disease dropped all over the, all over the country. Tom Frieden talked about the herd immunity. And what's interesting, Tom, here is that we were only giving a single dose here. And we probably covered only, as you said, 30 to 40% the disease started plummeting. And it's just an amazing vaccine. It's an incredible vaccine. And we started seeing success stories all over the world, wherever it was, wherever it was adopted. But the sad part of it was only one developed country, South Africa, had introduced the vaccine because of uh, Keith Klugman, who was a hip investigator, had, had some influence there. We thought this is not right. We really need to do something about the developing world. That's where children are dying. And I'll just tell you a story. In 2000, I went to the Ministry of Health in, uh, in India, talked to the health secretary, and tried to impress on him how important hip, hip vaccine is, how many lives we could save. He said, Dr. Santosham, how much does this vaccine cost? I said, $18 a dose. He sat up, leaned at me, and Dr. Santosham, my budget, immunization budget per child is 80 cents. You're telling me you want me to introduce an $18 a dose vaccine. I said, sir, we can get, we can get, uh, we can get help from donors. I said, I don't want to hear about this. This is an impossible dream. And I was crushed, and I walked out of that, that, uh, his office and thinking about that old song that some of you may remember, to dream that impossible dream. You know, I just thought, you know, this cannot be, there has to be a way to do this and we will come back, we'll, we'll make sure this happens. So in 2002, actually, at, uh, Jim talked about this, we pulled together a group, I think, Anne, I think you might have been there. We pulled together a group to Scottsdale, Arizona, and we brought uh, not, only, not only scientists, we brought program leaders, we brought donors, and there was tremendous energy. People, there were the conclusions of the meeting were then written up, and people went all over the world from Africa, South Africa, I mean, all over Africa, South Asia. There was pressure brought upon the donor community and organizations, international organizations. Eventually, Gavi put out an RFP, which we won. It was a consortium that consists of World Health Organization, our Johns Hopkins, CDC, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we were the executive committee, it's Anne Shukert, the Rear Admiral Anne Shukert, who is a very, very dear friend of mine. And uh, Anne is, was such a backbone for this whole project. Oko Belli from WHO, Professor Kim Mulholland from the London School, and Thomas Cherian. And this uh, wonderful lady here, Rana Haji, who many of you know. And I have to especially recognize Rana for her. She did a lot of the heavy lifting on this. And Rana was recently awarded this, uh, the uh, Sammy's Award. Not only was she given the Sammy's Award, she's the Federal Employee of the Year, Rana. Congratulations. <laughs> now, I have to tell you one story about Rana. Rana and I traveled all over the world together. And once we ended up in Russia, we were trying to convince the former Soviet Union countries to introduce the hip vaccine, you know, it was a good meeting. And so Rana said, well, let's go to Red Square. So we went to Red Square, and they had this big parade. And there were people with automatic weapons. She wanted to see the basilica. I said, Rana, I don't think they'll let us. So I asked the guy. He turned around with his automatic weapon. I said, OK, fine. You know, we don't want to see that. <laughs> but Rana says, no, no, no. He taps on the next guy. He said, Rana, let's go. He taps on the next guy, and he looks around. He's so shocked. He says, OK, go. <laughs> so, so we then get a private tour to the Basilica because no, nobody else was there. So Rana's pretty tenacious. <laughs> and, she, and when we started this project in 2005, only 20% of the Gavi-eligible countries were using the vaccine. So Rana and the team and many of our team traveled all over the world. You can see this looks like a Delta Airlines thing, but this is really true. Our people went all over and had all these meetings. And then we realized there's a disconnect between what we're saying, we were not wrong, and what they were saying, and they were not wrong. And this cartoon actually illustrates it best. So a guy gets lost in the balloon, and he says, uh, where am I? And the guy who's fishing says, 
you're 30 meters above the ground in a balloon. He says, you must be a researcher. He says, yes, but how do you know? He says, because what you told me is absolutely correct, but completely useless. <laughs> so, so, so he then says, well, you must be a policymaker. He says, yes, but how do you know? He says, because you don't know where you're going, you don't know where you are, now you're blaming me. <laughs> so, 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 I'm sorry. So anyway, we were able to break the gridlock finally. In 2006, we got several countries. 2007, we got more countries. 2008, went on and on. By 2010, we'd cover most of the world. The big hole was India. And this became a very big challenge. In 2008, we thought we had it. We had got the permission from the government of India. We got Gavi, we got Gavi funding, the finance ministry. The Secretary of Health was supposed to sign it, and he said, this is my last day in office. Let the next secretary sign. The next secretary said, no way, I'm not signing it. That was 2008. And was so, and, and nothing, nothing could be done for the next three years. We then had to go start all over again. We, go, we had to go to all the states. We had to get the parliamentarians in different places and had to bring pressure from the states into the central government. And, if, and there, was, there was a tremendous put pushback in India, if you talk about anti-vaccine groups in this country, you could see what says policy for public good or private profit, pentavalent vaccine unsafe, and even 2013, and it's all over the newspapers, and many of us were personally attacked, saying that we're hand in glove with the uh, private, private sector and we're all making money, that's why we're trying to introduce the vaccine. There was even a public interest litigation, a Supreme Court case, which, where they demanded that the government stop using hip vaccine. Thank, thankfully, we were able to block that. The government did not block the use of uh, hip vaccine. Eventually, in 2011, we got the government agreed to use, introduce it in two states. 2013, we got six more states. 2014, we got another 11 states. By end of next, next year, India will have, every state in India will use the vaccine. That was truly an impossible dream come true. We were really, really excited that that's going to happen. So as we said, uh, by, uh, by now, by, by next year, every country, including India, will, have, will be using hip vaccine. And, and Gavi's projection is that 7 million deaths will have been averted by 2020. So I want to conclude by just acknowledging some of the people I've had the opportunity to mentor, which includes Rana Hadji here and Richard Besser, many of you know, Richard walked into my office when he was an uh, intern and said, I've read about your work on oral rehydration therapy, I'd like to make a career in public health, would you, billing, would you be willing to mentor me? And I was so excited when he became the uh, acting director of CDC. I'm not going to go through all of these other individuals, all have done amazing things in public health. It's been a tremendous privilege for me to mentor these people. Moreover, I've also had the opportunity to mentor several Native Americans. When Pat and I arrived on the reservation, there was not a single graduate that we could, high school graduate, who had actually gone and finished uh, undergraduate. Now we have several that we've been able to mentor. Felicia has finished her dental school and public health. Olivia finished, became an RN and MPH, and then on and on. And she's a PhD, and Heather is a lawyer with an MPH. These people have all achieved tremendous things. And what I always say is, you know, these are bright young people, and my contribution is primarily is making sure that they aim high. <laughs> and that, and, uh, because the, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many ES officers there are in this audience, but the one thing I always say is aim, aim high, don't be afraid to fail. There's no better teacher than failure. Ultimately in life, it's not how many times you fall that matters. What really matters is how many times you get up. And set very clear goals. You know, uh, Florence Nightingale, uh, way back several hundred years ago, said to a young man called Patterson, was going to create, who was going for sanitary reform in India, and she said to him, you will, f you will face great opposition, but great things cannot be achieved without great opposition. So don't be afraid of opposition. Make sure you set clear goals I think uh, Yogi Berra put it best. He said, you better be careful if you don't know where you're going because you may not get there. <laughs> and very often young people come to me, they say, well, I want, I, want to, I want to achieve big things. That what is it you want to achieve? They have not set goals. They have not set a, a specific. If you, are, if you don't have a goal, you can't have a strategy. 
Anyway, I just want to come end by thanking the hundreds of employees I've had over the years who have been so dedicated. And these are the uh, unsung heroes like my first worker, Yolando Nasho, Pat, Pat knows very well, worked for me for 30 years, would drive hundreds of miles and never complain, never take a break. And this young girl, Novaline Goklish, who we, Pat and I knew when she was a child, she used to be in, in our Sunday school class. I nurtured her and uh, supported her through high school. You know, it's a very, very tough environment. They had three of her own, her own sister committed suicide. Two of her, one aunt and an uncle committed suicide, depression in the family. And you know, there were many times when, uh, when Novaline wanted to give up, but we were able to hang in there with her and she eventually graduated, became a bachelor's and she is now one of the supervisors and goes around teaching other people. That's a success story. But there are also sad stories, and one very sad one that I will tell you, which uh, a, young, a young mother came to me and Pat a long time ago, about 30 years ago, and said, I want you to, I would like my son, I want you to be the godparent of my son. Uh, I have his mother's permission to mention his name. Wendell was a lovely young boy, got into lots of trouble. I was able to get him out many times. But about a year ago, I got a call and said, uh, Dr. Santosh, I'm sorry to say your godson died. I said, what happened? He said, apparently he had gotten into drugs and uh, he was in possession of drugs with a gun and he wouldn't put it down the, and they, the police had to shoot him. It was absolutely a crushing, crushing blow. But now his mom has become an activist and she wants to make sure that it doesn't happen to other kids. So there will be, when you get into a cause, you will have both victories and failures what really matters is to continue and be persistent. And I want to end by thanking all of these mothers and parents who trusted me with their lovely babies. This family came to me. I was having coffee with my staff. I said, can we take a picture with you? I said, why? They said, every one of these. This girl was in our hip study. This boy was in our pneumo study. This guy was in our rotavirus rot 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 vaccine study. This guy was in our RSV study. And that's the kind of trust they've had. And I've had so much fun seeing these lovely babies, playing with them. They brought so much, so much uh, joy to my life. And if I want to just end up by one message to the uh, young professionals in this audience, as you start your journey, especially if there are EIS officers, as you start your professional journey, just remember that success is not always measured by the arrival. Success is measured by the way you conduct the journey. I just want to end finally with this very traditional Navajo blessing. With beauty before me, there may I walk. With beauty behind me, there may I walk. With beauty above me, there may I walk. With beauty all around me, there may I walk. And beauty, it is finished. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Dr. Santosham, for that inspiring talk. Jim and Sarah, it must be so rewarding to you to see the spirit of your prize personified in someone like Dr. Santosham. Uh, you know, we sit on the jury every year and we start our discussions by saying, how many million lives did these people save? And to, to see 7 million lives by 2020 and the million of lives that will be saved in the years following that. It's just amazing. So congratulations. Um, we want to invite you in just a minute uh, to join us next door in the David Sitzer Museum for a reception and a celebration of partners. And the theme of our celebration this year is Why I Give. And you're going to be hearing from a couple of our donors about why they give to help the CDC through the CDC Foundation. Uh, but before we head next door, I wanted you to just uh, listen for a moment uh, to the following video. You can watch, too. <laughs> CDC scientists and epidemiologists go right to the front lines of disease outbreaks, determining what's causing the disease, where it started, determining how it will spread if it's not brought under control. CDC needs partners to extend their 24-7 life-saving work. 
And we at the foundation are able to bring those partners to the table and into meaningful relationships with CDC. The value of public-private partnerships is that you're able to harness the capabilities, the core competencies of each of the different sectors to address the problem. The public health or population-based problems that we see around the world today are simply too large for any one sector to tackle alone. So CDC is doing its part as government, but we need others to step up and truly partner with this outstanding agency. This year we've managed more programs than ever in our history at the Foundation, almost 260 in this country and more than 70 countries around the world. And they range across the breadth of CDC's activities, everything from a network of surveillance for immunization activities in Africa to programs in this country to help teen drivers be more safe. People want to be a part of that. They want to be a part of making the world a healthier, safer place. And they know that the place to do that is by giving to the CDC Foundation to support CDC's work. Today, CDC has needs that only the CDC Foundation through its donors can meet. We simply could never accomplish our work without our donors. Well, thanks again to all of you from CDC who are here and uh, to all of you who are our donors and friends who've come to support CDC. Uh, we invite you now to come next door to the David J. Sensor Museum uh, where we'll have a little fun. Thank you for being here.